It's funny, isn't it? You think about Roman emperors, you picture gladiators, conquests, maybe a Caesar salad. Right. Not exactly known for their introspection. Exactly. But then you have Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor who's also remembered as a philosopher and whose writings, like meditations, are still read and studied today. That's what we're diving into today. And it is fascinating because most Roman emperors were known for, well, expanding the empire, military victories, that sort of thing. Big military parades. Exactly. But Aurelius, he was facing all these threats, rebellions, wars. But he was also reflecting on life, on virtue, on how to be a good person. It's such a contrast. He's dealing with Germanic tribes, a rebellion led by Cassius. Oh, and that rebellion was serious business. Cassius managed to get a significant part of the East on his side. Imagine trying to rule an empire with that going on. Talk about pressure. Mm -hmm. And yet, he's writing these very personal reflections. Did that help him keep things in perspective? Do we have any insights into that? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but it's clear that Aurelius was deeply invested in Stoic philosophy, which emphasizes, among other things, reason, virtue, and acceptance of what you can't control. And there was a lot he couldn't control. His own son, Commodus, for example. History remembers Commodus less favorably than his father. That's putting it mildly. Commodus's reign was, well, let's just say Aurelius's hopes for a philosophical successor didn't quite pan out. And it's almost like you can see echoes of this in meditations when he talks about the battle between darkness and light that exists within each of us. Man, family drama on an imperial scale. And to think, his wife, Faustina, even accompanied him on some of these campaigns. She was quite a presence, it seems, even accompanying him to the front lines, though her constant travels did raise eyebrows at the time. And she eventually died during one of these campaigns in 175 CE. A side note, but an interesting one. There's a lot of debate about Faustina's reputation. Some sources paint her as a shrewd political operator, others less so. History is written by the victors, as they say. But okay, so Aurelius is reflecting on life, grappling with all this chaos. Mm -hmm. How do those personal writings become the meditations we know today? That's the million dollar question. Because after Aurelius dies, meditations kind of vanishes mm. for centuries. Vanishes, like completely. Well, almost. We get these little breadcrumbs. Themistius, a fourth century orator, mentions Aurelius and his writings. And there's a reference in the Historia Augusta, a collection of, shall we say, colorful biographies of Roman emperors. So we know people knew about it but the actual text. Gone. At least until the 10th century, when a scholar named Arethas of Caesarea pops up with a copy, he even mentions making copies for others. So it's possible that the meditations we read today are descended from his copy. That's amazing. It is, but the journey isn't over yet, because in 1453, Constantinople falls. Huge moment in history. Yeah. But what does it have to do with meditations? Well, many scholars believe that's how meditations made its way back to Western Europe lost during Aurelius's time, re-emerging briefly in the 10th century, then making its way west after the fall of Constantinople. And eventually getting printed in the 16th century. Exactly. From there, its popularity just exploded, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. How so? Well, here's Marcus Aurelius, this emperor philosopher, remembered not for his conquests or his reforms, but for these deeply personal notes never intended for publication. It makes you wonder, what would he think about that? about people centuries later finding guidance and wisdom in his private thoughts. It's kind of humbling, actually. It is, and it speaks to the enduring power of these big questions Aurelius was grappling with. Questions about duty, virtue, purpose. These things are still relevant today. It's fascinating, and it makes me want to go back and read meditations with fresh eyes. Because if a Roman emperor, in the midst of all that chaos, could find solace in philosophy, well, maybe there's something there for us, too. I think so. And that's the duty of these texts, isn't it? Mm. They offer us a chance to connect with someone who lived in a completely different time, and yet they were wrestling with some of the same fundamental questions that we still grapple with today. Absolutely. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive. And for anyone listening who's now curious about Marcus Aurelius and meditations, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's a journey worth taking.
peace, that's what seeds of song Uh-huh When life's heavy, don't be rattled Keep your crew steady, never be battled Marcus, Marcus Stoic and pride He knew the rhythm, kept it locked in time I know when my opponent is asleep, I'm out there at four or five in the morning, chopping trees, working to this day. Because I can retire today. I'm well off, very comfortable. But I got the will to win. Take yourself out your comfort zone. Do not live in your bubble. Put some more air in your bubble. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. You will fail in your comfort zone. Success is not a comfortable procedure. What if we have that kind of attitude? The cars repossess. Nobody believes in you. You've lost again and again and again. The lights are cut off, but you're still looking at your dream, reviewing it every day and say to yourself, it's not over until I win. The heaviest things in life aren't iron and gold, but unmade decisions. The reason you are stressed is that you have decisions to make and you're not making them. Embrace the process. And then by the time you get up in years, you can be a man that you're proud of. Okay? So this is just an encouragement to just chill out. Just chill out. Embrace the process. You say, Dwayne, what process? Life. Be the guy who embraces the ugly, the miserable. Uh, be the guy who embraces hard work, the grind. Don't be afraid of being hurt. Don't be afraid of sacrificing some blood. You cannot change your life unless you change something. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. He believed in himself, and you can too. You can do anything that... It's your reaction to adversity, not adversity itself, that determines how your life story will develop. You'll see the most clearly at your life's darkest moments. Difficulties strengthen the mind as labor does the body. Seneca Fear is temporary. Regret is forever. Have patience and trust the process. The harder you work, the luckier you will get. If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Zig Ziglar about purity. Some persons raise a question whether the social feeling is contained in the nature of man, and yet I think that these same persons would have no doubt that love of purity is certainly contained in it, and that if man is distinguished from other animals by anything, he is distinguished by this. When, then, we see any other animal cleaning itself, we are accustomed to speak of the act with surprise and to add that the animal is acting like a man. And on the other hand, if a man blames an animal for being dirty, straightway as if we were making an excuse for it, we say that of course the animal is not a human creature. 
So we suppose that there is something superior in man, and that we first receive it from the gods. For since the gods by their nature are pure and free from corruption, so far as men approach them by reason, so far do they cling to purity and to a love of purity. But since it is impossible that man's nature can be altogether pure being mixed of such materials, reason is applied as far as it is possible, and reason endeavors to make human nature love. The first, then, and highest purity is that which is in the soul, and we say the same of impurity. Now you could not discover the impurity of the soul as you could discover that of the body. But as to the soul, what else could you find in it than that which makes it filthy in respect to the acts which are her own? Now the acts of the soul are movement toward an object or movement from it, desire, aversion, preparation, design, assent. What then is it which in these acts makes the soul filthy and impure? nothing else than her own bad judgments. Consequently, the impurity of the soul is the soul's bad opinions, and the purification of the soul is the planting in it of proper opinions, and the soul is pure which has proper opinions, for the soul alone in her own acts is free from perturbation and pollution. Now we ought to work at something like this in the body also as far as we can. It was impossible for the defluxions of the nose not to run when man has such a mixture in his body. For this reason, nature has made hands and the nostrils themselves as channels for carrying off the humors. If then a man sucks up the defluxions, I say that he is not doing the act of a man. It was impossible for a man's feet not to be made muddy and not be soiled at all when he passes through dirty places. For this reason, nature has made water and hands. It was impossible that some impurity should not remain in the teeth from eating. For this reason, she says, wash the teeth. Why? In order that you may be a man and not a wild beast or a hog. It was impossible that from the sweat and the pressing of the clothes there should not remain some impurity about the body which requires to be cleaned away. For this reason, water, oil, hands, towels, scrapers, nitre, sometimes all other kinds of means are necessary for cleaning the body. You do not act so. But the smith will take off the rust from the iron, and we will have tools prepared for this purpose. And you yourself wash the platter when you are going to eat, if you are not completely impure and dirty. But will you not wash the body nor make it clean? Why? He replies, I will tell you again, in the first place, that you may do the acts of a man, then that you may not be disagreeable to those with whom you associate. You do something of this kind even in this matter, and you do not perceive it. You think that you deserve to stink. Let it be so. Deserve to stink. Do you think that also those who sit by you those who recline at table with you, that those who kiss you deserve the same? Either go into a desert where you deserve to go, or live by yourself and smell yourself. For it is just that you alone should enjoy your own impurity. But when you are in a city, to behave so inconsiderately and foolishly, to what character do you think that it belongs? If nature had entrusted to you a horse, would you have overlooked and neglected him? and now think that you have been entrusted with your own body as with a horse. Wash it, wipe it, take care that no man turns away from it, that no one gets out of the way for it. But who does not get out of the way of a dirty man, of a stinking man, of a man whose skin is foul, more than he does out of the way of a man who is daubed with muck? That smell is from without, it is put upon him. But the other smell is from want of care, from within, and in a manner from a body in putrefaction. But Socrates washed himself seldom. Yes, but his body was clean and fair, and it was so agreeable and sweet that Tile most beautiful and the most noble loved him, and desired to sit by him rather than by the side of those who had the handsomest forms. 
It was in his power neither to use the bath nor to wash himself if he chose, and yet the rare use of water had an effect. If you do not choose to wash with warm water, wash with cold. But Aristophanes says, Those who are pale, unshod, tis those I mean. For Aristophanes says of Socrates that he also walked the air and stole clothes from the palaestra. But all who have written about Socrates bear exactly the contrary evidence in his favor. They say that he was pleasant not only to hear, but also to see. On the other hand, they write the same about Diogenes. For we ought not even by the appearance of the body to deter the multitude from philosophy, but as in other things, a philosopher should show himself cheerful and tranquil, so also he should in the things that relate to the body. See ye men, that I have nothing, that I want nothing. See how I am without a house, and without a city, and an exile, if it happens to be so, and without a hearth I live more free from trouble, and more happily than all.